sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, so this presentation will discuss part of my PhD, which is uh, where I present the first non-zonal time average field models for the Miocene, which we have named MTAM1. And I did this in collaboration with Richard Holm and Richard Bono and my supervisor, Andy Biggin. Um, so have a look at today's geomagnetic field at the surface. This is an image of the field intensity at the surface from IGRF 12, um, which shows that the field gets close to an actual dipole, uh, di di sorry, um, but it does have some non-GAD or non-geocentric actual di dipole features, like the high latitude flux lobes, mostly in the northern but southern hemisphere, and the South Atlantic anomaly, which was the main topic of my PhD. When we look at the same field, but at the core mantle boundary, and this time we're looking at the radial field at the core mantle boundary, you can see a lot more detail, but you see the same non-GAD features again. Um, in the South Atlantic and under Africa, you see these reverse flux patches that are basically the South Atlantic anomaly, but shown on the core mantle boundary. And you can also see these effects on the uh, flux slopes on like high latitudes. Um, but mainly you see a lot more detail than we could ever have uh, in a model that we gain from paleomagnetic data. Also, because when we show time average field models, most of the detail has been averaged out. Um, here's a time varying model of the South Atlantic is here as the 180 degrees meridian is central. And it shows that the South Atlantic anomaly does not appear until around 1900, um, which is should go about now. There's a first reverse flux patch. So this is again on the core mantle boundary. And this reverse flux patch is moving west to the location um, that we see it uh, currently, which was the previous slide. So now you can see these two clear reverse flux patches appearing, moving westward, that form the South Atlantic anomaly. Um, which means that this current feature of, this, of the magnetic field has not been a part of our geomagnetic field continuously. And the question is, um, has it been a recurring feature or is it just a one-off uh, and just a feature of today's field, which could lead to uh, a reversal even, has been, which has been suggested by some scientists. So to, um, to test if uh, the South Atlantic anomaly is a recurring feature of our field, we went to St. Helena to test um, the South Atlantic field from about 10 million years ago. And we did a paleodirectional study, which was published in PNAS in 2020. Um, where we see that the dispersion of our directions was a lot higher than what we thought uh, expected from a GAD field at that latitude, which was would be around 11 degrees dispersion. And we found a dispersion of about 21 degrees, suggesting that the field was at least behaving anomalously at that time. And then our paleo intensities, which are shown here, or the ADMs are shown here, um, which are getting published hopefully soon. It's under review at JGR. Um, also show a weak field at St. Helena around 10 million years ago. So this and some other more recent studies to suggest that the South Atlantic had irregular behavior on a million year multi-million year time scale. Question is, however, is it enough and consistently enough to appear in a time average field model, which is what we're going to uh, with the models presented in this talk. Um, so our models will show, use directional data to solve a non-unique inverse problem um, to show what the morphology of the geomagnetic field was like. Um, and we use Swerker harmonics to describe this morphology. And there are some previous models that use similar methods, like these models with thousand years. And most of them are like 10,000 years ago until now. And then there's time average field like our. And then ours actually goes back all the way through the Miocene. So that will add a very large 
portion of time to this collection of models. To create this model from Fortomycin, so MTEM1, we needed a database from directional data from the Mycene. So we collected all the quality volcanic paleodirectional data that were published. Um, and so we used Scopus and Google Scholar and Magic and all the databases that we knew to, to use and, and collected over 1500 papers that we had to go through. And then eventually found 40, 42 quality studies of the right age and that didn't have any rotations in the in the data um, and those 42 studies had 38 localities with at least 10 sites per locality and those localities are shown in this image here um, the the plate tectonics were corrected for using the nnr marvel model and then the data was split up and referred There was enough data to be present in a normal data set and in the reverse data set and the combined. And whenever the dot is blue, it was present in the com combined data set and in the normal data set. But then for the reverse data set, there weren't 10 sites or more left. So it was uh, no longer present. And the same goes for pink, but the other way around. And then the white dots, I don't know if they're visible, but there are a few one here in Brazil and one in. New Zealand, that is a locality that has 10 sites, but then when only looking at normal or only looking at reverse, it didn't have 10 sites, so it was excluded from the data sets. Um, first, we looked at, oh, here's for the non-geologist, an overview of the Miocene and how many reversals there are uh, in the geomagnetic polarity time scale. So first we looked only at the normal data. We had 26 localities left. And as I said, each with at least 10 sites. So each with at least 10 different uh, times and lava flows included. And um, yeah, we used the GAD field as a prior model. So that's what the more damping used to create this model, the more it started to look like GAD. Um, so here is, the model misfit versus the roughness basically of the, of the model and the more damping it was used, the more misfit you had beta, the less damping you, the, the more rough the, the, the model was. And here's an overdamped model in the top right and an underdamped model in the bottom right. All of these models are on the core mental boundary. And our preferred model here on the left. Is interesting and we will talk about more. We compared this model to LN3, which is the most recent time average field model of the last 5 million years published by Cromwell and others in 2018. And the first thing to notice is that their model is damped a lot more towards the gap field so it definitely looks different but the sim the features that are appearing in their model are around the same longitude so there's around africa there is a feature and then just west of south america there's a feature so to test if these models are alike we created our own ln with their data sets so for the last 5 million years and only normal data, which is what they used, but with our modeling technique, so the, basically our own damping parameter chosen, so we could make it look more like MTM1 or MTM1N in this case, the normal model. Um, there are still features in similar locations. So there should be the, this sort of Southeast Asia lobe, that is in both of these models, there is a downwards going lobe in Central Africa, but already there's some difference showing up there. Um, and then in LM3 prime, there is a downward going lobe, but it doesn't actually become a reverse flux patch as clearly as we see in M10-1N. Um, but that could be due 
to a different data set. For instance, St. Helena is in our data set, but there's no data from the South Atlantic in the last 5 million years that is included in the model. So who knows what will happen when we include some data from the South Atlantic in the last 5 million years model. Um, and then you can see a clear difference actually here in the uh, Pacific Ocean, which again is most likely caused by a lot of data included from Hawaii in the last 5 million years that is not included in the Miocene data set. So are these features that are in both models, are they robust or is it just because of similar data locations included in our models? That is a question that we don't know the answer to quite yet. Um, first, to test our own robustness of the model, we compare our PSVM N data set and to the PSVM R. Did I skip one? I feel like I skipped one. Yeah. Okay. So our normal model to the reverse model. Jesus. <laughs> um, where we see the reverse flux patch under uh, South Atlantic or under the Atlantic actually in both cases. So this model on the left is based only on our normal data and the model on the right is based only on our reverse data. Um, and the fact that these show quite similar features in similar locations could suggest field symmetry, meaning that the field behaves the similar in a similar way in a normal time as in a reverse time. Um, the differences that we do see, like in Central America, a little bit, and in Eastern Africa, could be due to different data distribution, but we don't know that exactly. To test further, we use instead of a GAD fire, we use the opposite model as a fire. So for the normal model, we use the first model as a fire. And Model is normal as a fire, um, meaning, and as a result, we choose to see even fewer differences, which gives us additional evidence that our field might be symmetric. Um, and then that also gives us reason to combine our complete data set and create a model for the entire Miocene. Um, as if the field is symmetric, we don't actually need to separate them, which is what we did. And we ended on with all of our data from the mice, um, increasing the resolution a lot, where we still see these two reverse flux patches under the Atlantic, which shows us that that is a robust from our model. Flux lobes that we see in current uh, field images. And we see more structure in the Atlantic versus the Pacific. And it could be because of higher data resolution, because there's just more sampling in the Atlantic. It could, however, also be more than that. Some of the implication from our study is that the Atlantic reverse flux patch shows evidence for consistently recurring irregularities in the South Atlantic. And the field symmetry suggests no memory, what we say memory of the non-dipolar magnetic fields, so or no parts of the small-scale structures are uh, the same in the normal and the reverse fields. So they're basically just all um, reversing during a reversal and not some parts of the field are staying the same during a reversal. And then a little summary. Uh, so we created a new paleodirectional data set for the Miocene called PSVM which we used to create a, the first non-zonal time average field model for the Miocene called m one The normal and the reverse model shows similar behavior. So there's no substantial field asymmetry shown between normal and reverse times. And all of the, our models show robust reverse flux, flux patches in the South Atlantic, suggesting a consistent uh, result with recent studies, which suggest recurring irregular behavior in the South Atlantic on a million year time scale. Thank you. Well, that was my intention. Thank you, Neil. Uh, do we have any questions? So there's a, we have a, a question in the chat. So 
is from Karen Began. And uh, the question is, are you going to speculate on the causes? So I'm guessing the question is the cause for the South Atlantic behavior or the Atlantic behavior in the models, is that correct? Yeah, I, 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 yeah yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, so there are a lot of speculations about causes for that. Um, my work is obviously about the surface of the geomagnetic field or the core mental boundary, but not the actual behavior of the deep earth. But in my uh, recent studies, I have sort of created a summary of all the all the speculations out there. There's people suggesting uh, that the large low shear velocity province under Africa um, is creating extra turbulence in the outer core, which could create the reverse flux patch. There is an uh, eccentric gyre suggested that is in the outer core and reaches the core mantle boundary um, just under the Atlantic, which also is suggested, suggested as a cause for the anomalous behavior in the South Atlantic. Um, but definitely more work is needed. Yeah, see, so provide a, a relatively robust answer to that question. <laughs> Okay, thank you. So we have another question from the chat. It's from Connell. Um, and the question is, are the number of localities sufficient to produce a robust view of what the field of the CMB looks like? Yeah, that, that is a good question. I guess that is the question that comes up with all models. Um, I would say the fact that we see similar features in all the models and, and that the features are even similar to the last 5 million years, even though it comes from a completely different data set, um, means that we can somewhat have confidence in, in the results, but it's always a, this could be one of the answers kind of a situation because there's not a completely, uh, like a high resolution in data and there's always a, it's always a non-unique answer as well. So yeah, it's a it's a question that I can't answer, but I do personally trust that the reverse flux patches under the Atlantic are, are not a coincidence. So uh, do you have a, an additional question, Connell? Uh, okay, <laughs> <Good>. thanks. <laughs> Well, I, I, I could just ask, you know, if anyone actually knows what the answer, you know, what would an ideal end be for this sort of thing? Because then that might actually help us in terms of things. Yeah. I mean, and of course, the spread as well, because of course, Sorry? and of course, the spread. Yeah. Sites, you know, you know, could we sit down and as a desk based exercise and basically say, all right, well, if we had. 50 sites in these locations, we would get a robust thing. And then you could actually sort of design a program around doing that. It'd be a larger scale program. But. That, that would be an interesting <laughs> exercise. <laughs> no, yeah, that would be if we could do that. But I think it's always a case of the higher and the higher the resolution. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, I agree. And you're limited by the localities you have rather yeah. than the localities you'd like to have. Exactly. It's still, a, it might be a, it might be a fun, it might be an interesting toy problem for somebody to have a go at and see. All right, well, you know, if if you could get thirty sites distributed in this manner, you know, would that be better than fifty sites? I see Richard has unmuted himself, so maybe he's volunteering. Yeah. I can't hear you, Richard. I'm not going to volunteer, but the answer is going to be real, real disappointing. I mean, obviously, this sort of thing depends on um, let's just imagine the impossibility that the data is like approaching some type of uniform sampling, which it can't. Right. Because we've got oceans. Um, it's going to depend on the degree that you want. And it's. It's not there. There's, I mean, there's theoretical ways to do it. There's this Driscoll and Healy grid, and you can do these inversions, but it's going to be like, well, I'm looking at it right now. It's like 180 degrees over N. So if you want it at like, you know, if you want your grid to be resolved at, you know, two you know, or your degrees to be like three or four, five, even five yeah. degrees, you're going to need samples every um, 
20 or 30 degrees. So just think about what that would mean for the earth. It's going to be an N of, you know, uh, 60, 100, somewhere like that. And it's going to be pretty regular over the surface. Yeah. So it's, it's super depressing if you actually want to approach it from an ideal theoretical. I think we just- I mean, it's not even like N of 50 to 100. And we've got 42. It's not even that far ahead. Well, uh, but that's like uh, every, well, but that's uniform. You need even, uh, you need yeah. even spacing. So if you yeah. have clusters, if you have clusters, you skew it yeah. to wide. You kind of, yeah, you have to like, yeah, you have to like bin it at that point and then look at that. And yeah, I'd have to sit down, but it's going to be, you know, whatever you want. Like if you did, but 30 degrees in, in latitude or longitude and, and 15 degrees in latitude, you're still talking um, dozens <laughs> to hundreds. And that's well, that's that's going to only give you a couple degrees for your your revert inversion, All right? So if I can just weigh in here, just you know, at the risk of sounding like Rich at home, uh, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. Um, so you know, yeah, you can't trust this as a as a as an image of the of the time average field. Um, but we do think it's very interesting that the South Atlantic. Uh, this anomaly reverse flux patch uh, jumps out in both a normal and reverse data sets as well. So it's perhaps telling. Uh, if, exactly. if I can uh, just in a positive sense, kind of echoing what Andy said, when we've played around looking at dynamo simulations and how much data you need, not for these kind of time average fields, but for PSV, we find that something like PSV10 does have sufficient data coverage, and and um, the Elsmiocene data set is is approaching that as well. So, um, I can't speak. We haven't looked at time average field inversion uh, um, confidence, but if you look at PSV measures, um, VGP dispersion, uh, you don't need theoretically perfect, nice, regular data. You just need to have some amount of global coverage at latitude and longitude and, and you can do pretty well for the level that we can resolve in teleomag so that's my optimistic take but the theoretical sitting down from a desk and working forward is, is depressing so work from rocks and settle with what you get i, I would say